Um, pr probably the biggest thing is the fact that the referee always gets the blame. Um, so as an assistant referee, um, you tend to avoid the blame so much. Um, whereas you often see in the newspapers or media, um, the referee gave an offside that was wrong. Well, he didn't really give it. He was told. But then again, he always gets the blame. So I think that's the main thing. But I think probably the main reason is the fact, or the main difference is, as a referee, um, you are already, or you're always the man to make the decision, because you can give the decision um, or not give the decision, whatever happens. So even if the assistant puts a flag up, you can say no, I'm not having that. So I think um, you are the man in control, um, and you have to really also. Give authority to the game as a referee whereas for an assistant referee you're there to assist um, and you're not actually running the game the VAR show the one place for your weekly football update Hello, very warm welcome to the VAR show, the show which talks about all the best major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to continue the theme of interviews and we have the former Premier League referee Mr. Roger East with us today. So without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Roger for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And I would like to begin by asking you how are you and what are you doing these days? Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, these days, um, I coach referees um, at a, a national league level. Um, so we used to call it conference, but it's National League now. Um, but my day job is uh, I've gone back to the family business um, as a timber merchant. And um, during the pandemic, um, I've been working right through and um, keeping the sawmill open. Um, so in essence, I'm very busy. <laughs> Definitely. And I have two questions from your first answer itself. And you know, like the first one is you said you have gone back to your family business and of course, that has been running for quite a while. Did you, What made you shift and become a referee? Yeah, the family business has been going since 1886. Um, but I hasten to add, not me. I'm not that old. Um, so what, what made me is I used to be an international assistant referee um, until 2007, um, when time in the family business became very difficult. Um, and I was offered the opportunity to be promoted to a referee. Um, which suited me very well because I always wanted to be a referee rather than an assistant referee. Um, so I went into um, Football League refereeing in 2007. Um, and then in 2012, um, when I realised I may have the opportunity to referee in the Premier League, um, I went to the family firm and by this time I was a senior director and said, uh, I am going to be a referee. Um, unlucky. <laughs> So um, that's what I did. And I, I basically worked part time at the family business um, when I wanted to. Definitely. And you know, the second question that sprung up to my mind as soon as you said you are coaching uh, younger referees or referees at the national level. So it's like, uh, what, what, uh, what are the things that you focus on when you first you know, get a referee? What do you try to impart in terms of knowledge? Well, I think the thing is with um, any referees at that level, they know law. Um, but they really struggle with management of the game. Um, and I think at the Premier League level, um, the one thing that most of the referees are very good at is managing a game or managing an event. Um, so with myself, um, I tend to focus on um, cone, sort of really honing in on their management skills um, and really try and teach them um, if they do certain things, are they going to upset people unnecessarily? Um, and as a referee, I have my, a little saying is that as a referee, if you're going to put your head above the parapet, make sure it's worth it. Because when it gets knocked off, it's very painful. So I th hope you understand that. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, like, uh, I'll move on from that. And, uh, you know, like in your career, you said you have been involved in a lot of high profile games because every game in Premier League and even the other leagues are very high profile. In your opinion, which particular game, according to you, was your best performance and which one was your worst? Oh, I suppose, um, as an assistant referee, probably my best performance was in a tournament 
in the under 21 championships in uh, I think it was 2006 um, when I went as the assistant referee to a, uh, a new FIFA referee um, in England uh, whose name was Harold Webb and he didn't do too bad to be fair to him um, so I uh, ran the line in that tournament very well and ended up doing the final um, with Howard as fourth official. Um, so that's probably my best performance over a few weeks as an assistant. Um, I was also fortunate enough to ref, uh, run the line in the FA Cup final. Um, so, and the Charity Shield, or Community Shield, they call it now. Um, so as an assistant, I did okay. And then as a referee, probably um, my biggest um, probably pleasure was refereeing a playoff final, League One playoff final um, at Wembley. Uh, the new Wembley, and that was probably very special um, because walking out of Wembley with the ball under your arm is is quite special. Um, domestically, probably some of the most enjoyable games I did were um, were actually both FA Cup ties, and they were both live on national television. Um, West Ham, Man United, West Ham, Liverpool at the old Berlin Ground, uh, or, or Upton Park, as most people know it in the world. Um, and they were fantastic cup nights. Um, and they were probably um, steeped with atmosphere and um, because it's a special competition. Um, so they were probably the most um, thrilling, I suppose. Yeah, um, I think that's about it. Definitely. And of course, Anil, like uh, you said, like uh, you gave two accounts of your best during your assistant referee days also. And in, of course, they're very different uh, in terms of the responsibility, but uh, according to you, what is the major difference between being an assistant referee and being a uh, main of match official? Um, pro probably the biggest thing is the fact that the referee always gets the blame. Um, so as an assistant referee, um, you tend to avoid the blame so much. Um, whereas you often see in the newspapers or media, um, the referee gave an offside that was wrong. Well. He didn't really give it, he was told. But then again, he always gets the blame. So I think that's the main thing. But I think probably the main reason is, the fact, or the main difference is, as a referee, um, you are already, or you're always the man to make the decision. Because you can give the decision, um, or not give the decision, whatever happens. So even if the assistant puts a flag up, you can say, no, I'm not having that. So I think um, you are the man in control. Um, and you have to really author... Uh, uh, give authority to the game as a referee. Whereas for an assistant referee, you're there to assist um, and you're not actually running the game. Of course, and you know, like, uh, you have been in the game for a while now and you have been off the game also for, I think, two years now. And since you started, what there has been uh, uh, involvement of a lot of technology which has come into the game and also there have been a lot of rule changes. How has the game in terms, in the opinion of a referee changed? from when you started till now? Well, certainly when I started, I mean, I, I was uh, in the professional game for 19 years um, and I gave up actually exactly a year ago, pretty much last uh, a year ago, May. Um, so I've been out of the game a year, but I did see the technology come in. Um, I was trained on the VAR. Um, I referee games with VAR in, in League Cup games. Um, so I've seen all the technology, to be fair. Um, and I think the one thing that's changed um, is very slowly, when you first referee, you, you go out with a whistle and you go out with a book and that's it. Um, now, when I started, when I finished, I would go out with a, a buzzer on my arm, on the left arm. I would go out with a communication system on my right arm. I'd have a communication in my ear. Um, I'd have VAR in the other ear. Um, and basically, you were almost a walking robot. Um, not in the sense of being a robot, but literally because of the technology you were carrying. Um, and I think that's the one thing that's changed. Um, I think the majority of things have really helped the game, like goal line decision systems have taken very difficult decisions away from referees. Um, so that's helped. And I think the communication between the assistants and the referee has improved the overall control of the game um, and improved decision making and the performance of the officials. Um, but I think certainly if you go back to local park level, um, I think the main thing that's improved is that a lot of young referees are now understanding that you have to be fit and you have to be um, the right shape to be a referee. 
Um, and I mean that nicely because there's some, uh, whether you're tall or small is irrelevant, but um, you have to be the right sort of shape um, and improve your refereeing that way. So I think that's helped. Professor Neil, like uh, you spoke on VAR, like how you were trained, but uh, you uh, you did not like you were there only for a short time uh, under the VAR. And uh, what is your opinion of it? Because it has come under a lot of stick. What is your personal opinion? Well, I think that any new system is always going to come into stick. Um, the the problem you have in England is that the media attention of uh, football general all over the world because everyone is interested in the Premier League because of um, the excitement of the league and I think you're always going to have um, people knock it um, but it's a system that was devised to stop big mistakes and that's the theory behind it and the theory is wonderful um, but when you start uh, riding a bike you often fall off and with VAR it will take a year or two to bed in so everyone understands it. Everyone accepts what decisions are going to be made. Um, and I think the ironing out of how decisions are made um, and how they are transferred to the public, as in the people watching the game in the stadium, as in the media um, and the public in general, of how do we understand what the referees are trying to do as a VAR. So I think it's going to be a process that will take two or three years to bed in. Um, but I think it's here to stay. Um, and I think the actual theory of it, um, I always liken it to the fact that if you drive to Manchester 250 miles for me and I make a mistake on the field, I've then got to drive 250 miles home knowing I've made a mistake. To actually avoid driving 250 miles home making a mistake, if the Mr. VAR would tell me that I'm not and we can change it, that makes the 250 miles a lot more pleasurable. So that's why I look at it. So, you know, like you said, of course, it makes and it, it will hopefully be better and, you know, like make the life of the referees much, much more easier. But like you mentioned, like, you know, when you started, you just had to go with the book and a whistle. And now you have a lot of other technological advancement, which you have to carry on on yourself, like a robot and semi-robot or cyber robot, whatever you call. And uh, do you think it has helped the referee or what is it? Does, does it put a psychological pressure on your head that now, since I have so much aid, I have to get all the decisions correct? I don't think it does because I think as a referee, um, you are still refereeing the game totally. Um, and then all you're really doing is the major decisions are being checked. Um, and you then have the ability to change them if they're wrong. So I think if you think about that as the theory, if that theory can actually work or will work eventually, um, it's a great theory. Because um, wh why would you want to referee a game and make mistakes? Of course, and you're like, you said like, if you make a mistake, you have to drive back home a long way, you know, thinking that you made a mistake. And many former referees have also called out for more protections of referees. On a personal note, did you have a fear while refereeing any games? Not really. I was fortunate in the fact that um, I'm about six foot tall or 1.8 meters in your language because you're very young. Um, and uh, I had a very bald head and uh, I was reasonably fit and strong by throwing wood about. And I never really felt physically threatened because they weren't too sure whether I was strong or not. And the fact that I'm not is irrelevant. I looked reasonably strong. So I didn't get sort of physically um, attacked or anything. Um, I never really felt threatened because um, the games I used to referee, there was so much police presence anyway, it didn't really matter. Um, the only time I really felt um, in my career a bit disappointed was um, I was criticised by a particular manager on television um, for getting it sending off wrong, um, when in actual fact it was right. Um, they even went to appeal and lost the appeal, so that's how right it was. Um, and because he'd criticised me, all of his supporters started phoning me up on my personal mobile. Um, and at the time, unfortunately, my wife was in hospital. So um, no caller ID was also the hospital, so I had to answer them. And I did get quite exasperated with fans phoning up just to give me a, um, let's say, expletives, deletives uh, down the phone, which is quite worrying. Um, and really, that's only because I was criticised by a manager, probably. So that's the only time I really got upset. So, of course, you, know, you mentioned a very like interesting topic. That generally, as a fan or as a 
person who is very far from the reality what's happening there we just see the managers after the games coming and criticizing and even we will jump on the bandwagon yeah this referee is bad because yep. we do not know you know what's happening yep. so is it just for the you know like entertainment purpose or they really mean it like what is how what is the equation with the managers well i think the thing is that is is it um it is trying to uh delegate the um let's say the mistakes because as a manager if you went on and said uh let's say um i got all my decisions wrong i picked the wrong players i did this they wouldn't have a job very long so the best thing to do is to go on and say well we played really well but unfortunately roger made a mistake which meant we lost so that means that he's he's a good chap and i'm a bad chap and uh and i understand that and and to be honest with you most of us referees we we didn't mind that because if we had made a mistake fine um it was when they tried to blame us when we hadn't which was a little was a bit disappointing of course and you know like uh, in terms of your personal uh, self you know like did you have or do you have any particular team that you support well that was interesting because i was probably one of the i think only two referees on the premier league at the time that have no preference at all with which team i as and i don't support any team um i have no affinity with any side whatsoever um whereas a lot of the referees do um and at the start of every season you sign a form to say that you are a supporter of a side and that also included that if any of my family decided to go and buy a season ticket um i would have to declare that as well so in my very final year um after 19 years in the professional game i had to declare an interest in yeovil town football club because my son decided to go and buy a season ticket and uh, so therefore i was not allowed to referee yeovil town matches in my last year um much to the amusement of the premier league when i told them but uh, that was that's the truth yeah of course and you like uh, i i i wanted to know you know like generally the the follow up or the segue to that was like how difficult is it for a manager uh, i mean for a referee to manage a game in which his favorite team is playing so uh, of course you do not have any preference so i think that would be easier is i think the main thing with that is is when um i like into let's say i a referee for a lot of my um son's games and i think probably it's it's harder because you actually try to be fairer and when you try to be fairer you're almost end up being harsher against the side that um let's say you have affinity with but certainly in the professional game you're not allowed to referee those sides anyway so um it doesn't ever come up um and despite the media saying that uh, uh, a certain referee supports arsenal or what it isn't just simply not the case if they're refereeing them um and um i think one funny moment in my career was the fact that um anthony taylor obviously was allowed to referee manchester against manchester city even though he lives in uh, he supports altrincham which is a manchester based club if that makes sense and um because of that they decided that because i was a wiltshire referee i would need to go and referee swindon so i got sent to referee swindon against crew i think and anthony went and refereed manchester city man united so i did thank him for that and um and said that he really needs to uh, move down south <laughs> so he didn't he didn't take kindly to that different you know like uh, you know like i wanted to ask you another uh, follow up on that was that have you managed any uh, cup final or was it something that you uh, missed out i i didn't referee the fa cup final i missed out um i refereed um the playoff final uh, the fa vars final which is like the amateur uh, cup final um and i always always seemed to be involved in playoffs so I ended up doing about 6 or 7 playoff semi-finals. Um and to be honest with you I love them. They the playoffs are a fantastic atmosphere where you you remember that 100% of the crowd are basically um supporting sides. There is there are no people that are in the ground just watching. Um so it's quite an atmosphere. Um uh, but I wasn't fortunate enough to referee the cup final. Was it something that you wanted to do a lot? that got oh, me everyone does um every referee in england always wants to referee the fa cup final um but not everyone can um and uh 
it was just unfortunate that um, I, I wasn't high enough up the list every time there was a possibility of doing it. Of course, so I wanted to ask you, like, in terms of being a referee in England, what is the pinnacle of being a referee? Is it uh, refereeing a FA Cup final? Um, I think it probably still is. Uh, the pinnacle would be, still be the FA Cup final. Um, but you can also argue that um, probably for me, because I got onto the Premier League when I was 47, uh, my pinnacle was always refereeing as many um, Premier League games as I could. And also being um, a professional referee was probably my pinnacle. So I suppose it depends on when you come into the professional game. If I'd have gone on to the Premier League when I was 30 something, I'd have probably been disappointed not to referee the cup final. Um, but because I actually didn't get on there until I was 47, um, I never really expected to referee it. Of course, and you know, like you said, you got into the Premier League quite late. So, like you know, like just for general knowledge, I wanted to ask you, like, what is the average age bracket that you get referees in the Premier League? I would say the average age in the Premier League is probably about. It's probably early 40s. Um, there's probably half of them are 40 or less and the other half are 40 to 50. So it's it's about early 40s, I would say, is the average without actually looking. Um, my only claim to fame is I was the oldest ever. Because uh, when I ref refereed my final game was my 54th birthday. So if you look in the record books, I'm there as the oldest ever. There you go. <laughs> Of course, that's quite a thing. So, like, I want to ask, like, how did you, like, manage to keep so fit? Because as a referee, you need to be fit as a player and also be mentally sharp to give the decision on point. How did you train yourself, like, you know, at that age? Well, even um, when, when you get older, you have to manage your body. Um, so, basically, I trained. Um, every time I felt like it, I trained, which was usually about four or five times a week. Um, and then if I felt a bit tired, I had a rest. Um, but uh, I was always very fortunate in the fact that I didn't carry weight. Um, I'm still only about one and a half kilos more than I was when I finished a year ago, which is not bad. That's probably a bag of crisps to you. you know? And um, so, I mean, I was, I was always reasonably thin. Um, I was always blessed with a bit of speed. Um, and probably, I was probably strange in the fact that when I finished, I hadn't lost my speed, but I'd lost my stamina. Um, and normally it's the other way around. You lose your stamina, but or you lose your speed, but not your stamina. Um, but I wanted to go out or retire when everyone thought I wasn't the oldest. <laughs> so um, I could I could still sprint. So, so I was okay. Like, I wanted to ask you, like uh, you know, like many we have a lot of uh, referees who listen to this program from Nepal and also from India. So it's like. If you could share, what was your workout like? Because or what was your training uh, schedule? Because you were refereeing at the top level at that age. If you could, if you don't mind, can you share, please? Well, my training basically was um, I used to train probably um, about one hour intensity. So you would do a, a medium intensity, high intensity, or low intensity depending on what your match game was. So if you were doing a Wednesday, say a Wednesday match. Um, I would do my high intensity probably on the Monday. Um, then I'd have a lower intensity the, the day before, like a sprint session. Um, then I would do the game. And then you'd have a recovery session the following day. Um, and then I'd probably have a, a rest. Um, and then I'd do another high intensity session. So I would do, on average, about one and a half high intensity sessions a week. Um, and I think you just need to uh, make sure that you put the hours in. Um, you, and bear in mind that that was my job. So um, I think there's no excuse not to train. Um, so um, even when you're coming up through the system, um, there's two days at a weekend, so you can train one of them. Um, and you can train an evening. Uh, but I used to do um, quite a lot of work in the gym. Um, and quite a lot, when I was older, I used to do quite a lot of spin classes and this sort of thing, um, which are aerobic, but they're not so hard on your body. Um, so that sort of job, or that sort of uh, training. Um, whereas I, I've also got a park behind where I live, um, which is probably got about a 70 meter stretch of grass. Um, and I used to do quite a lot of um, basically up and back in various time schedules. Um, so 
my schedule was reasonable um, for an old man. <laughs> of course, and yeah, like, uh, did you do anything particular or specific for men- mental health or something? Um, probably not for mental health. I was always, um, for me, I think it's very important. Um, and we had um, psychiatrists, so, uh, psychologists, sports psychologists with us. Um, and I often talk to them uh, because we used to train uh, once a fortnight at St. George's Park. So in addition to our other training, we always used to meet up every fortnight to train um, where we would meet the sports psychologist. Um, and we'd have a meeting with them. Um, but to me, I think it was it was very important um, a few years ago for me um, I was unfortunate enough to have a kidney failure and um, when I came back from the kidney failure um, the sports psychologist helped me a lot in um, basically getting back because I was told I wouldn't referee again and I did referee for about another three years so um, but it was important to be mentally strong um, and not get down on yourself so that's probably the only time I used it um, and I would recommend using them because um, they understand my mind a lot more than I do. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Of course, and you know, like, uh, I'll come to a very, very popular, you know, like debate topic, you know, on the internet and generally in the pubs that England yep. do not produce good referees. And since you have been involved in maybe in the Premier League also, and also you have been involved, like you said, maybe, you know, like coaching some new referees, you know, like down the ladder. What is your opinion on it? Well, I, I would I would disagree. I, I think England over the years have produced fantastic referees. And I think um, the reason I would say that is that um, certainly when I used to go abroad as an assistant referee, every country we went to open, uh, welcomed us with open arms because uh, the referees from England were strong, they were good, um, and they were, um, how would you put it, um, they, were, they, they couldn't be swayed by a crowd or a, or a team to give a decision. Um, so... I think we produced a lot of good referees over the years, um, and I think if you look back, we produced um, the likes of Jack Taylor, who refereed the World Cup final, Harold Webb Cup final. We haven't done bad. We've refereed the Champions League quite a few times, um, and I think people are very easy to down the English referees. Um, so I think there there are a lot of good ones. Um, what we're going to do about? I think there's quite a few coming up. The systems now with the football league. Um, League One and League Two, and then going into the Championship, pairing them for the Premier League, um, is a very good grounding. Um, I hope there's some really good ones. I've certainly seen one or two good ones in the Championship. Um, and I think that uh, the problem is with the English media is they're too easy to criticise someone that's trying their best. Um, and uh, you can be the best referee one day and the worst referee the following. Um, but I think overall, anyone refereeing in a professional game, certainly in the Premier League or the Championship, uh, trust me, they're very good referees. Of course, then you're like uh, staying with the same theme. And if if you are following any of your colleagues' work right now, if you are to rate or give a top five of your referees refereeing right now, who would they be? Well, I think in England, you would say that probably, um, I think all of them are good. And I'd rather not say who I think they're good, but uh, I, obviously in England, Anthony Taylor and, and Michael uh, Oliver are considered the best two because they're at the top in the European game. Um, so you would obviously put those into the top two. Um, and then I think we have a lot of very good young referees coming through, um, the likes of you know Chris Kavanagh um, and uh, Paul Turney's doing quite well in, in the Premier League. Um, and I think we've got other ones just coming on, Peter Banks. Um, and there's a few that are coming up through the system that are also very good. And we've also still got a lot of experience on the Premier League with uh, Martin Atkinson, Mike Dean. Um, and so I think those, um, Kevin Friend, um, Andre Mariner, I mean, we've still got a very lot of experience there. Um, so I think it's unfair to say, um, I'll go back to the first thing I said is that they're all very good and until they make a mistake and then they're not quite so good as they were the week before. Um, so I think you can probably put five at the top this week and then we'll change the five next week. How's that? Yeah, of course you can do that. You know, like uh, one question just popped in my mind, you know, and I was speaking to one, I think it was Keith or 
maybe someone i forgot okay and um, he said me that the problem according to him is like the fa or the pgml they are letting uh, people like howard webb or mark go after their career and instead of bringing them and making them work with the referees so that you know they can uh, share the experience and knowledge with the future referees do you think that should be done um i think it probably should but i think you also got to remember that everyone is entitled to work where they want to so it may be that um whilst people criticize them not for going into the pgmol or efa it may be that they got a better offer somewhere else because i don't know um so it's probably a bit unfair to say that um i think that the people that work within the organizations now um really do well and they try their best um and from my point of view um i would love to do that sort of thing in the future um when i finish coaching the youngsters up through the system um and given the opportunity i would love to do it but whether the opportunity ever arises is another thing um because i think you um you you have to be lucky and be available when someone wants you or vice versa so um i i think um every new person when there's a new chief at the pgmwell or a new chief at the fa will probably change the guard um because everyone does in business so i would imagine that would happen um and then may you might see exactly what you just said so i think it it could change um because no one ever is in a job for 100 years are they so <laughs> so you like uh, again this is a very uh, this might be a very very basic question but i wanted to ask you like what do you do you miss being a referee um i i personally don't miss being a referee as such um i still do a little bit of local refereeing and i still referee a few charity games um so i don't necessarily miss it uh, the one thing i miss is walking out of the tunnel um with the buzz or the adrenaline rush when you walk out in front of 50 60 70,000 um i do miss that um because they you can't replace that with anything um the adrenaline rush um but i also enjoy coaching young referees um and of the five i coached this year one got promoted and that was a big you know bonus for me um so i i i think i had my time as referee and i did 19 years and i loved it and i really enjoyed it and uh, i think it was time for me to give up so that's why i probably don't miss it because i didn't leave before i'd finished if that makes sense of course and uh, you did uh, be a referee for quite a while like you said your claim to fame was like you're the oldest referee in the premier yeah. league so you know like uh, since you are you are so old and you have uh, managed for quite a while in the premier league and also other leagues if you had to give a piece of advice to young referees coming up what advice would you give that's an interesting actually because i think with with regard to um refereeing or giving advice um obviously every referee is different so some would want certain advice from the others but i think that the main thing is is that you have to enjoy refereeing um because if you don't enjoy it you'll never make a good referee um you have to be strong um there are times when you're going to become unpopular um uh, by sending someone off that upsets the crowd etc or giving a penalty but if they're the correct decisions you have to do that um i think you have to have empathy for the game so you have to understand um what the players and teams are trying to do um and it's not just all about you so you have to have empathy um i think then you need to be approachable you need to be um if someone asks you a question shall we say after the game you can't just dismiss them you have to be um approachable and and answer a question if you're asked a question in the right way so i think that's a very important trait um but that probably only comes with experience to be fair um and i think you need to be willing to accept advice um and criticism um and if you take the refereeing aspect now is that if you're assessed and you're criticized on a certain thing you can take that two ways you can either take it that i don't believe the man he was rubbish I, you know i'm i'm not listening to him or you can say well if he's right what can i do about it um and uh that i think was my philosophy if someone criticized me i thought well what can i do about it rather than uh, just blaming them so um i think refereeing is a is a great sport and it's also can turn into a great career so um it's it's worth pursuing you know, like i have one question on that and before we wrap it up and you know like uh, what was the best criticism that you ever received 
Oh, the best criticism. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say best individual bit of criticism, but uh, I refereed a local game or, a, or actually a conference game. So like League 4 or 5 in England, that would have been. And um, I uh, watched the game and there was a particular advantage. So I looked over to the other side of the field and the advantage was saying, when I turned around, there was two players on the field and, um, or on, on the grass. And I'm thinking, well, then maybe there's something happened here because they were both literally holding their face, shall we say. And uh, I hadn't seen what happened. Uh, none of my colleagues uh, were able to help. So I stood both players up and said, uh, I, you know, I haven't seen what's happened, but uh, you've obviously done something to each other. So uh, you better behave yourself because I'm going to be watching you. At which point I had a standing ovation from the home crowd. And I then realized that I probably should have sent the home player off because he punched the other player. But there you go. You, you can't always win. So when I went into the changing room, the assessor said to me, he said, uh, you got that wrong and you got something else wrong and this wrong. He said, but I like the way you referee. And within two years, you'll be a football league referee. And he was actually true. But he gave me a terrible mark, which put me down to the bottom of the list at that particular moment. So there you go. <laughs> so, it's not always bad. Yeah, of course. So, you know, like on that note, Roger, thank you so much for talking to me. And I wish you all the best. You know, like, hope you can produce more referees, nurture them, and also all the best for your other endeavors. That is a business. And hope we can talk again soon. Thank you once again for coming. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. And thank you for you. You take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.